Metal Morals, an Iron Age on Morals, by Jeff Stepp, read by Isaac Arthur, NSS President. High in the remote Canadian Arctic, astrobiologist Graham Lau battles the brutally cold winds that blow down the glaciers of the Borup Fjord Pass as he struggles to free a drill bit that's seized up and frozen in its borehole. Eventually, he must bend it far beyond repair in order to get it out, bringing his efforts to extract core samples from the mineral-rich area to an early end. It's one of the hazards of drilling out in the middle of nowhere, he says, you have no access to replacement parts, no place to get it fixed, there's no one around for hours, even by aircraft. Located 81 degrees north of the equator, in a glacier-carved valley just a stone's throw from Greenland, Borup Fjord Pass is the only known place in the world where sulfur from a natural spring is brought up to the surface and deposited over an ice field, freezing it, along with any evidence of geological and biological processes, in time. Thankfully Lau and his team had enough samples in hand to declare the mission a success, though it's the sulfur that brought them here, it's a different mineral tagging along with it that Lau is ultimately interested in, iron. There are these ancient springs that once brought sulfur-rich waters to the surface along with several types of iron, especially pyrite, also known as fool's gold, Lau says. Of particular note for him is a geological formation known as Gossen. Gossen is an old mining term, sometimes called an iron hat or red hat. They are these deep red caps of oxidized iron that can appear at the top of mineral veins like these as a result of geological processes bringing up iron-rich sulfides to the surface, which then oxidize or rust as we might say colloquially. Fool's gold and rusted iron might not sound valuable, but to Lau, the metals themselves are not the prize, it's what might lay in and on them because of what brought them to the surface in the first place. These ancient springs present an environment we have a disequilibrium of chemistry, we see it often in hydrothermal vents and hot springs, in environments we have differences in chemistry in a very small area. This is what early life feeds on. So here in the past, where there's iron, there may be life, or at least traces of it. When they analyze the samples drilled out of these gossens, Lau and his partners find evidence they believe indicates the presence of biologics, the leftovers of life. We call them chemolithoautotrophs, he explains, these organisms when they were alive basically metabolized the iron minerals around them, and this process left behind telltale signs on the surrounding metals, the most striking of which are these tiny filaments about one micrometer in width. Lau was careful to note that it's possible the filaments, 50 times thinner than a human hair, and other pieces of evidence he discovered could have been created by non-biological means, but in his analysis this is less likely. Either way, Lau's true interest in the Gossens isn't the possible evidence of ancient life on Earth, it's the fact that the processes that created them, and therefore may have sustained life, should also exist on Mars. Finding evidence of life on Mars, active or otherwise, is a holy grail of astrobiology. Many scientists have pursued this Herculean task, and Lau's tack toward Gossens is a new approach. The trick on the Red Planet however is finding them, which as of now has not been done. You can imagine that in the high arctic, the reddish color of the Gossens tends to stand out pretty easily on the landscape, like these little rusted domes, Lau explains, but on Mars the entire surface is oxidized red, so it's extremely difficult to see them from the limited perspectives we have today. We just need rovers, or maybe humans, to start digging into some of the features that may contain Gossens, because where we find Gossens we may find, finally, evidence of life on Mars. But if Gossens haven't been seen on Mars, why does Lau think they might exist there? There are good reasons geologically to believe Gossens are present on Mars, he says, there is so much data out there now that shows ancient Mars had a very wet history, we see river deltas, valleys, evidence of water flowing, and some of this water goes underground, where it can become hydrothermal as it interacts with the systems that generate heat below the surface. This process brings the liquid back up, along with iron-rich minerals, and over time, a Gossen can form. Lau suspects that whatever life may exist within Martian Gossens, if they exist at all, will be similar to the kind of life they find in terrestrial Gossens, but he leaves the door open to something completely different. For him, both outcomes are equally compelling. If we find life in these Gossens and it shares similar information storage systems like DNA and RNA, or it shares similar metabolic pathways to Earth-based organisms, 
That's remarkable because it means Earth life and Mars life share some sort of common ancestor, which of course begs the question, where did this ancestor originate, he ponders. I'm open to the idea of panspermia, where life is seeded from comets and asteroids that smash into planets, but I think it's just as fascinating if life started on Earth or Mars and then somehow migrated to the other. On the other hand, if the life we find on Mars has a different metabolism, or information storage, or isn't carbon based at all, that's also obviously game changing when it comes to understanding our place in the Universe. While Lau is optimistic that one day someone will be able to find and examine Martian Gossens, he also chases a bigger dream when it comes to the development of the Red Planet. On Mars, some Gossens could also have been created by igneous activity, so the upward flow of magma could have created large deposits of what is basically smelted iron. What good is smelted iron when it comes to life on Mars? Well, for ancient life, very little. But Lau's interest in these Gossens revolves around life that's a little bit more familiar. Say we get humans to Mars, the key things we talk about are oxygen, water, food, and radiation protection. These are vital challenges to solve in order to sustain a short-term human presence on the planet, he explains. But I tend to think in longer timelines and what that will require, if we're going to have any sort of infrastructure, any sort of large-scale civilization, really if we're going to build anything on Mars, we're going to need two things, tools and raw materials, namely iron. Tools we can probably send with the astronauts, but there's no way we're loading literal tons of iron ore onto a rocket and sending it to Mars, so if I'm right about these Gossens, then they could potentially represent a source of iron that we can mine, smelt, and turn into larger pieces of machinery and infrastructure that will need to support large quantities of humans. It is easy to understand what he means. The first people on Mars will either live in small habitats brought from Earth or possibly within the lava tubes under the surface, but to have buildings, laboratories, schools, factories, or anything industrial, they're going to need iron to build the beams, spans, and all the other foundations of an industrial society. Of course, before any of this is remotely possible, someone must get there first, no small feat in of itself, but there is a wonderful dichotomy about mining iron on another planet, digging into the past to build the future, and thinking about what came after Earth's own Iron Age, great civilizations, explosions in trade, migration, and technology, one can only imagine the future a Martian Iron Age might bring. Thanks for joining us today, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great content. Again, this is Isaac Arthur, President of the National Space Society, and on behalf of the NSS, I want to ask you to check out Ad Astra, our quarterly magazine bringing you articles and stories from some of the best minds in space.